As I mentioned um, uh, in my opening remarks, um, tonight's theme is very much about innovation, and I thought I'd just tell you a quick story about how Tony came to be here. Um, so Tony's no stranger to Auckland. In fact, he's been coming here for about 10 years and, uh, and working with the University of Auckland delivering um, uh, classes on entrepreneurship there. And, and many of you, uh, if you've looked at Tony's bio, will know that he's involved with Stanford University, uh, which has been one of the major partner universities for the University of Auckland. And, and we have a number of young um, Aucklanders there doing very well um, and then launching from there often into Silicon Valley. So um, I happen to be down at Grid AKL, which is, uh, for those of you who have not heard of it, is our innovation showcase here in Auckland. It's just along the street here in Horsey Street. And I was talking to Richard Gill uh, from Cloud M, who are one of the, the early stage companies in there. And Richard mentioned to me, Brett, um, we're having a board meeting coming up in the next few weeks. And uh, one of our board members is Tony Sieber. And I think you might be quite interested in what, uh, what Tony has to say about um, innovation. So, uh, like everybody, I did a search of Tony and found out that, uh, um, like most successful entrepreneurs, uh, he's a disruptor. So he looks for disruption um, and opportunities for disruption to to create, if you like, an energy or an edge. Um, and already in his working life, he's been very successful in disrupting the printing industry, where he made a, a significant. Um, a contribution as the founder of a very successful startup company in the US. And so his focus on disruption has turned to clean energy, um, but also to, to vehicles. So I think as we think about, and Tony and I have talked about this earlier today, as we think about Tony's messages tonight, um, I, think, uh, I think it's important that we think about it in terms of how Auckland might lead. Um, because with innovation and disruption, there's an opportunity to be a follower and there's an opportunity to be a leader. And I think um, we have the spirit of leadership in, uh, uh, in this city and that's how um, I'd like us to think about uh, some of Tony's messages tonight. Um, and I think I'd, I'd like to acknowledge again the, the contribution of Mighty River Power who are also, also see that same leadership opportunity and very readily came on board with this uh, this opportunity because they too see that the chance to lead. So without further ado, I'd now like you to join me in welcoming Tony Sieber. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Um, thanks for that introduction. Um, thanks for the sponsors, Mighty River Power. Thank you to CloudM for bringing me here we're disrupting health and safety, and uh, you'll hear about that some other time. Um, but tonight, I wanna tell you about the clean disruption of transportation. Um, but before I tell you about the future, um, I wanna tell you about the past, um, because there's something to be learned about the past. Can you all see the picture okay? Um, can anyone tell me where the car is in this picture? Anyone? Where is the car? That's New York City, 1900. There is one car. Let me take you to same place, same time, 1913. Where is the horse? This is disruption. And when disruption happens, it happens very, very quickly. Um, anyone who has used digital cameras can tell me what they were using 12 years ago. Was anyone using digital cameras 12 years ago? What about Android or uh, iPhone? No, no one, no one? That's disruption for you. When disruption happens, it happens very quickly. Um, so today's agenda, I wanna tell you about technologies, disruptive technologies that are going to change everything having to do with private and public transportation. Um, and I wanna start with the electric vehicle. Um, 
some of you may have heard that the Tesla Model S um, out of Silicon Valley was named the car of the year, 2013. Not the electric car of the year, it was the car of the year. Consumer Reports said it's the best car ever that they have tested, ever. Not EV, the best car ever. Um, and in the US, it's already the best selling luxury car in America. That's an electric vehicle. Now, minor detail, who can afford an electric vehicle? Now, that's not my car. I actually, <laughs> I actually don't own a car. Um, and I'll tell you about it uh, uh, tonight. But first, let's talk about disruption because it, it, it's a word that can be abused. Um, what does it mean? Here's what it means. Um, a disruptive product, usually technology, helps to create a new market. And in doing so, it basically significantly weakens, transforms, or even destroys an existing uh, product category. So you can look at the, uh, the examples, digital photography versus film, um, so MP3 players versus CDs, and so on and so forth. Um, now, here's the interesting thing about disruptive products. Initially, they're usually dismissed. They're dismissed as inadequate, they're dismissed as you know, low quality, they're dismissed as not good enough, or even toys. Um, and, uh, but it's usually a matter of time be before they improve and they get so much better that they destroy the existing competition. Um, and it's usually the experts and the insiders who dismiss disruptive products. I mean, I can show you 200 uh, of these quotes from mainstream experts, industry experts and insiders who said, nah, not good enough. Cell phone, not good enough, too expensive. Um, uh, you don't get cell phone reception everywhere. It's intermittent. Now, if you substitute cell phone for solar, for instance, same thing, right? So I keep hearing the same comments and I'm like, it's on to something. Um, so let's go back to horses and cars. Um, it was just a matter of time before cars disrupted horses. There was nothing that the carriage industry or the horse industry could do about it. And that's what this product, this disrupt, disruptive products do. Um, so question, is the electric vehicle disruptive? I'm gonna give you five reasons. I can give you nine. I'm just uh, <laughs> not gonna give all of them. Um, number one, the electric motor is four or five times more energy efficient than the internal combustion engine. So your car um, only turns about 80% of the energy in gasoline into kinetic, uh, into movement. Just about, I mean 20%. 80% is literally wasted, up in the air, okay? On the other hand, the electric motor flips that. Um, it uses just about 90% of the energy and it may waste five or 10%. Because of this and because transporting gasoline, imagine drilling somewhere in Saudi Arabia, refining it, putting it on a ship, bringing it here, and all that costs a lot of money, right? Electricity is easier, you develop it, and within a microsecond, you have it at home. Because of this combination, an electric vehicle is 10 times, at least, cheaper to charge on a per mile basis than a gasoline car, 10 times. Anytime you have a 10x improvement in, a, in, a, in an important dimension, you may have a disruptive product. Three, the EV is 10X cheaper to maintain. The electric motor lasts for decades. And because it has fewer parts, uh, fewer parts will break. So um, it's cheaper to uh, charge, it's cheaper to maintain. 
um, wireless charging. Um, so basically, if you have a bus, you can have the infrastructure so that every time it stops, it's going to charge. Try that with, with a gasoline vehicle, right? Um, and, and this is one of the most important things. The electric vehicle is so much more powerful, so much more powerful than the internal combustion engine that it actually shifts the price performance um, equation of the um, uh, automotive industry. So Elon Musk, the CEO of Tesla, and I'm giving Tesla as an example um, of EVs tonight, uh, said that their next SUV, which will cost about $40,000 US, will have the performance of a Porsche 911 Carrera. Wow, right? So for 100 years, this is what the industry has given us. You want low performance, you pay low price. You want high performance, you pay higher price. You want the Porsche, 100K. You want the uh, Enclave, 40K, right? Now, electric vehicles do this. It totally shifts the equation. Now you can get an SUV for the same price as an Enclave, but with the same performance as the Porsche. It totally, totally disrupts the industry. And this alone will basically change the whole equation. Um, so, okay, so it is disruptive. How long will the transition take? And, and, and I've done the numbers. Um, in my opinion, we'll need 200 miles minimum as a range for mainstream EVs. If you do those numbers, then you'll come up with, today, 200 miles will cost $25,000 for the battery alone. And therefore, the EV will cost $75,000. It's still a little pricey. Um, but um, one of the things that I do in my work is look at the exponential cost improvements in technology. So the lithium ion battery has been going down about 14% per year for about 15 or 20 years. But in fact, since 2010, it's been going down 16% per year. And that's because there used to be three industries, three multi-trillion dollar industries that invested. Uh, there used to be one, uh, electronics, basically your laptops and your iPhone, that invested in lithium ion batteries. Now we have three, energy, automotive, and electronics. So triple the investment, triple the market, the, the uh, technology is going down, improving much more quickly and going down in cost that much more quickly. Um, as an example, you may have heard that Tesla is going to open a $5 billion battery factory. $5 billion. Now this one factory in and of itself is going to double the lithium ion production in the world. Just one factory. Just the fact that it's gonna be built it's going to cut costs by 30%, not including breakthroughs. That's even better, right? So let's do the numbers. Uh, lithium ion batteries are going down by 16%. What's that gonna do to the cost of EVs? Okay, so by 2018, the industry will be able to build a 200 mile electric vehicle um, that's gonna have the performance of a Porsche 911 Carrera, by the way, because electric motors are so much more powerful, um, for 40 grand. So no gasoline vehicle equivalent to a $40,000 EV will be able to compete with it. And I'm talking 2018, not 2080, 2018. Keep going down the cost curve. And by 2020, the industry will be able to produce a $31,000 electric vehicle um, that goes 200 miles. And did I mention has the performance of a Porsche 911? Okay, okay. I, I, I don't know if I forgot. Now, by 2022, the industry will be able to produce a $21,000 EV that goes 200 miles and has the performance of, okay, um, 
So basically, after 2022, it'll be able to compete with the Kias and the, and the, and the Porsches and the GMs and basically any car produced out there. 2022. Now, even if I'm a little bit optimistic, which I'm not, um, and we say 2025, basically by 2025, the gasoline car industry will not be able to compete with EVs, period. That's 11 years from now, okay? So conclusions from um, electric vehicles. One, the mass migration from gasoline vehicles to EVs is gonna start around 2017, 2018. Two, all new cars will be electric by 2030, maybe before, like I said. All new cars will be electric by 2030 and oil will be obsolete because all new cars are gonna be electric by 2030. Okay, let me talk about the mobile internet. Now, this is actually my phone, what I'm showing. Uh, did I say I don't own a car? I don't own a car. I do everything using this, my iPhone app, um, and I'll, I'll talk about it. So if I wanna get on the bus, there's an app for that. I know exactly when it's coming and where it's taking me and when I'm gonna get there. If I want to get on the train, there's an app for that. Um, car sharing, ride sharing, I don't take taxis anymore, I do ride sharing. It's all in there. My whole public and, tra and private transportation is here. I wanna talk about a couple of things though. Car sharing, um, there's a company called Zipcar that basically has on-demand individual transportation. So anytime that I need a car, I just you know go on the app and I say I need a car for two hours. I rent it, it's two blocks from my place, I take it for two hours, it includes gasoline, it includes insurance, it includes everything. I just show up, take it, go shopping, come back, done, done, right? I don't need a car. Now, here's the interesting, the interesting thing about um, car sharing uh, companies like Zipcar. What they do is they take, there's a ratio of every 15 users of Zipcar um, for one car. So they basically take 15, 14 cars off the road. Now remember that 15 to one ratio, share to own ratio, 15 to one. Um, so basically um, models like this are changing the whole concept of car ownership. I mean, if you can use a car, pay seven bucks an hour for a couple hours, why do you need to own it? Um, ride sharing. Um, you may have heard of companies like Uber and Lyft. Um, what they're doing is, this is a new breed of companies that connect people, actual people. Some of you may be drivers of Uber and Lyft um, with um, basically folks who need rides. They're competing with taxis head on, right? Um, and let me give you some numbers about Uber, one of the companies. They were started in 2009. Um, now they're in 155 cities in 41 countries. As of December, they were getting a million uh, ride requests per day. A million per day, okay? They were collecting a billion dollars a year and they're doubling that every six months. Every six months. Now, they don't own cars. They don't own anything. This is software, okay? Um, so 2013 revenues, $200 million. Now, it gets better. They recently raised $1.2 billion uh, from uh, Google and other venture investors at a valuation of $18 billion, 18, this is a company that did not exist in 2008, okay, and does not own any cars. Um, let me compare that. Air New Zealand has a valuation of $2 billion. So there's this company, all software, um, that is worth eight times, nine times what Air New Zealand is. That is the clean disruption of transportation for you. Um, okay, so smartphones, 
are changing everything. They're becoming the center of transportation. Uh, they're social, they're connected, it's all real time. Uh, end of taxis. Taxis are gone. It's just a matter of time, depending on the market. Um, now, another set of technologies that's, that's amazing in terms of growth and in terms of how it's going to get into everything, sensors. Uh, and you may have heard of the Internet of Things. So sensors, if you own a smartphone, if you own an Android, uh, you have 12 plus sensors. It knows where you are, it knows how, do you, how you move, it, it has light sensors, voice sensors, all kinds of sensors. They're getting cheaper, smarter, uh, embedded everywhere. Everything that can be measured will be measured everywhere, all the time. Okay, here's how fast the sensor market's growing. Some types of sensors are growing by 200, 700% per year, per year. Um, and this is what it's gonna look like in 10 or 15 years. Some folks are forecasting that we may have 10, so today the market for sensors, we get 10 billion sensors a year, that's the market. By 2025, 2030, some folks expect 10 trillion sensors. Now, I want you to think about that figure. There are 7 billion people on Earth, 10 trillion sensors. That's 1,200 sensors per person per year, okay? Now, here's an example of how uh, that applies to transportation. So I mentioned that I did not have a car, but my girlfriend did, did, um, ex-girlfriend. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was disrupted, yeah. Um, so the, one of the most, she had a Volvo 2000. One of the most annoying things about a car, other than the cost, is that little check engine light. When that check engine light goes on, you don't know if the car needs to be washed or it's just about to blow up, right? <laughs> but it has all the information, it's all in there, right? So this little sensor, about yay big, $99, I bought it, it tells you timeline for the, for the trip, it tells you how fast you're going, it tells you where you're going, all that information is in the black box whether you know it or not. So this sensor thingy told me all of this, all of it. And of course, it told me the check engine light, what it was, which was bugging me to no end, right? It only cost me a hundred bucks and I look good doing that. Um, but, but here's how it's going to change um, a lot of things. Um, there's a startup company in San Francisco that's offering one of these uh, sensors that you can plug into your car and they can offer you insurance, car insurance by the mile. Now, think about the way that car insurance companies work today. They know your age, they know where you live, they price it. That's not a very good way to price insurance. They have no idea how you drive unless you have an accident, right? And then it's too late. That's not very smart. Now these folks know how you accelerate, where you park, where you are, when you drive, <laughs> they know everything. So they can actually price insurance to a level that no car, com car insurance company can. So using sensors will disrupt the car insurance industry. Okay, unless they of course do it themselves. Now, vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication. Um, so basically we're talking about sensors talking to one another when you drive. Um, and uh, so you can talk to other cars, you can talk to traffic signals, school uh, signals, basically everything having to do with transportation. Um, and it can be any type of transportation, bikes, uh, motorcycles, cars, buses, trains, ferries, whatever. So everybody will be able to talk to everybody when, of course, all cars have 
vehicle to vehicle communication. Now imagine every single car having one of these, sending information every microsecond. One, there's a lot of data, a lot of data, right? Big, big data. But also everything is connected to everything. Every car is connected, every traffic signal is connected, every school uh, bus is connected so that uh, we can uh, finally see traffic as a living, breathing thing. Now, imagine that if you use something like a Fitbit for your heart rate or to count uh, you know, your health, uh, you can also connect that. Um, so soon, soon, within 10 years, we're gonna have trillions of sensors in billions of devices, and a car will be a device, generating all kinds of information from humidity to your heart rate. All of that is gonna be connected to that internet of things. Um, and so, conclusion. Um, vehicles are using increasingly sensors. Everything having to do with transportation is being connected. It's measuring everything about you, everything about every car at all times. Um, and this is basically the internet of things. And I'm gonna put all these things uh, together in a second. Now, the other major, major uh, disruption in transportation is gonna come from um, autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars. Um, so Nissan has announced that by 2020, um, they will launch a fully autonomous car worldwide. 2020, this is not, you know, 2040, 2020, that, that's six years from now. Fully autonomous means what? You can sleep in your car, basically. Not when it's parked, but you know, basically you can go to work and sleep in your car. Do Facebook, work. You can do basically anything you want. Um, now, can you play the video? Let me show you this quickly. This is Google's latest car as of May 2014. <laughs> No, no steering, steering wheel. wheel no steering wheel. Yeah. You sit, relax. You don't need to do nothing. It knows when you need to stop. It knows when you need to go. <laughs> it actually rides better than my own car. Yes. <laughs> sure. What she really liked was that it slowed down before it went around a curve and then accelerated in the, in curve. the curve. She's always trying to get me to do, do it that way. That's the way I learned <laughs> in high school driver's ed. So if I had a self-driving car, I could spend more time hanging out with my kids or helping them with their homework, even just tending to them, finding out how their day was and not having to wait till you get home and have dinner and all that, so it'll be good. I love this. <laughs> this car is ready. It, it's ready, it's out there. They're, they just built a hundred of them and they're using them, uh, some of them anyway, in the uh, Google campus in, in Mountain View. And just to show you, this is what a Google car sees. This is what uh, the technology is called LIDAR, the short for um, laser and radar. Um, they can see 200 meters ahead and actually 360 degrees, uh, 200 meters. And um, so LIDAR, just to give you an indication of exponentially improving technologies, um, the one that they use, the, the LiDAR is the hat uh, on top of this car, was 70 grand in 2012. And the latest version is $10,000. Now, I know an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley that, who claims he's making them for $1,000. So the, the, this is the type of virtuous cycle that happens when a market develops. The self-driving car will not be more expensive than just a generic elec uh, uh, electric vehicle or even a gasoline car. Um, of course, with all the goodies that it has. The question is, will the public buy into these things? And uh, Cisco did a study and look at the numbers. Brazil, 95% um, of Brazilians say they will use them. They probably haven't even seen one, but they're ready for it. Right? I mean, in India, in China, I mean, most people are ready for this. Um, 
So in terms of acceptance uh, of the market, which is always, of course, really important, um, a lot of folks are ready. I'm ready, I can't wait. Now, here's what's interesting. Most high-end cars already have most self-driving technologies. If you drive a new high-end Mercedes or BMW or Audi or Volvo, you are already um, using a lot of these technologies, already. I mean, you, you can drive it 25, 35 miles per hour on the highway and just as long as you keep your hand on the wheel for legal reasons, it just goes today. Now, the US Department of Transportation has this matrix from zero to four, where zero is humans are in full control and four being uh, the car, the computer is in full control. We're already at level three, already. So we just need a little push to get us to full, full autonomy. And the Google car is nearly there. Um, so in fact, ever, uh, since that press release in September 2013, that Nissan was going to launch their autonomous vehicle in 2020, they're like, actually things are going faster than we expected. We now expect to launch it 2018. 2018, full autonomous car. And the only reason, according to CEO Carlos Ghosn, that they would not launch it is legal, not technical, okay? Um, now, that's great self-driving cars, it's great, all that, but what does it mean? What does it mean? Here's what it means. We human beings are not great drivers, okay? You may, uh, may not have heard that before, but we're not great drivers. Even when we're not drinking or speaking on the phone or talking to other people, um, we're not great drivers. 1.2 million people die in car accidents every year worldwide. And half of them were not even in a car, okay? Now, not only that, we waste 95% of highways at best because we leave so much space between the cars behind us, on the sides, and 95% of highways are wasted, okay? Now, um, two technologies, just two of the technologies that go into self-driving cars, um, adaptive cruise control, and um, so just ACC can improve highway capacity by 40%. So think about all the highways that are being built right now and all the billions of dollars going into highways, if you just add this little sensor thingy, 40% more highways. Now, if you add vehicle to vehicle communication plus ACC, just two technologies, that in and of itself can improve highway capacity by 273%. Just two little technologies, okay? Now, what does that mean? Autonomous vehicles can end congestion by increasing highway capacity by at least 4X. What that means is what? 80% of highways are redundant already if all cars were self-driving. Okay, now highway now let's talk about parking. In the US, there are 500 million to 2 billion surface uh, parking spaces. We, we only have 300 million people. And, and, and we always complain about lack of parking, right? Um, in some cities, up to a third of the surface of the city is taken up with parking spaces. In Houston, there are 30 parking spaces per person, per person. Amazing, right? And still 40% of gasoline is wasted looking for a parking spot, 40%, right? Now, cars, in fact, are our second largest capital investment 
after our homes, we don't spend more money on anything but cars. And yet, we only drive them one to two hours per day. Think about that. Cars are parked 96% of the time. Think about it. Car industry has done such a great job with you people. They get you to pay 40 grand, plus gasoline, plus insurance, plus all the hassle, to use it just 4% of the time. Wow, right? Now, 90% um, of the time they're parked, and free parking is very expensive. <laughs> very expensive. Taxpayers pay at least $20,000 for each free parking you know, curb or off-street parking. $20,000, maybe up to $70,000. There's no such thing as free parking. Um, but it's all gonna change. And how's it gonna change? Think about combining something like Uber with the self-driving car, where you always have a car at your two minutes away. You say, I'm here, I wanna go there, right? All we want from car ownership is what? Mobility. We want them to take us from point A to point B anytime at a reasonable cost, right? And self-driving cars, um, so far, it looks like they might be 80 to 90% cheaper on a per mile basis. So if you can go from anywhere to anywhere anytime um, at 90% less money, why would you wanna own a car, which is an expensive bookend, in other words, right? So when you do this, it's gonna flip the equation. Self-driving cars don't need to park, really. They're gonna pick you up, drop you off, and pick somebody else up. Think about it. Which means that cars, instead of being 90% parked, they're gonna be 90% used. Even if it's only 80%, what that means is the world is gonna have 80% fewer cars. Does that make sense? 80% fewer cars. There's gonna be no need to own a car once you combine mobile internet and the cloud and big data and self-driving cars. So I told you that the zip car share to own ratio was 15 to one. Basically for every user, uh, we take uh, 14 cars off the road. Even if you do five to one, which is a more conservative number, you still take 80% cars off the road. Done. Okay. 80% par of parking spaces, redundant. We don't need them anymore. We don't need driveways in your homes. We don't need parking, we don't need garage, especially in the downtown area because they're gonna drop you off, pick somebody else, and, and keep going. And if and when they actually need to park to recharge, they can do it somewhere else where it's cheaper for the land and so on and so forth. Um, now, an example of a city doing this, or at least announcing that they're gonna do it, Helsinki, Finland, just announced that they're gonna do exactly what I'm saying. The downtown area uh, is going to be knit together with driverless cars, minibuses, uh, ferry, and this and that. Basically, they're doing the infrastructure so that all of these uh, transportation options, private and public, are gonna be linked via software. Basically, they're doing what I showed you, what I've been doing for seven years. Um, but they're gonna do it at a city level. And they're gonna make car ownership in Helsinki obsolete by 2025. That's only 11 years out. Um, okay, so conclusion. Car as a service, mobility on demand is going to change the concept of individual car ownership. Basically, we won't need to own cars anymore. We're gonna have 80% fewer cars on the road, which means the auto industry is gonna be disrupted. I mean, they're gonna have to make uh, only 20% of the cars that they make now. Just two companies could make all the uh, cars that we need, just two companies. Um, and of course, the car insurance industry is gonna be disrupted. 80% um, of highways are gonna be basically redundant, 80% of parking spaces, all of these changes by 2030. Okay, big data. 
um, is going to be huge because all of these technologies are nothing if not data producers. Uh, the Google car generates one gigabyte per second. It could fill up your laptop in about one minute. <laughs> one each car. Imagine a million of these going, you know, generating all this data and sensors and, and AVs. And so all of this data is going to generate. Okay, so the number of sensor based devices uh, is growing exponentially. The number of sensors within each device is growing exponentially. The amount of data that each one of these sensors generates is growing exponentially. See where I'm going? The number of connections between all of these is also growing exponentially. So what you get in the end is a combinatorial explosion of data about transportation. So today we make basically investments, 30, 40 year investment decisions that are going to cost you billions of dollars on the basis of very little data, very little data. Now, this big data is going to be a much better way to make decisions about transportation. Ah. Okay, so let me give you an example of um, how you can use big data to make smart decisions. Uh, MIT uh, looked at uh, New York City taxi cabs uh, data for one year. And here's what they, one of the things that they found out. Um, taxis in New York make 150 million trips uh, in or out of Manhattan. 73,000 of those started at Grand Central and went to Union Square. And 94%, 94,000 went from Union Square back to Grand Central. That's one and a half miles. That's a 10 minute walk, 15 minute walk, right? So out of all that movement in Manhattan, you know, we have 160,000 trips that are going between just point A and point B, just a mile and a half down. Now, if you know that, and we had no idea before MIT did this study, and the only way they did it was with big data, um, then you can make sensible decisions about transportation, okay? Now, I just want to give you one example about what you can do, what a sensible... We're here at CES trying out the Navio, which is a self-driving shuttle. It's uh, very cool. It's actually used for uh, locations such as college campuses or the military or even corporate campuses like Google or places like that. So right now we're on a track, we're going around, and it's going by itself. There is not a conductor or anybody driving this right now which is great, so it follows a track, it has laser that basically looks at the markings on the sides of the road and also any pedestrians that are there. So it, the laser can sense all around the shuttle. We expect to see this in the States in the near future, so stay tuned. But it's actually a great concept and we really like the idea. It helps with mobility, getting people, a bunch of people on this tram, and it also is fuel efficient. So there you have it, self-driving vehicle riding on uh, batteries, it's an electric car, it already works, it already works in Europe, um, and it goes very slowly. If all you want is one and a half miles uh, back and forth between point A and point B, you can start with this, instead of having 160,000 taxi going back and forth and back and forth and burning gasoline and all that, right? So, and the thing about this, you making decisions using actual data, um, is that you spend 100K or whatever, 200K on, on something like this. If it works, you expand it. It doesn't work, then you shut it down. Um, it was just 200K, not a billion dollar highway. Does that make sense? So that is the beauty of making decisions with big data. Okay, so let me wrap this up um, and put all these things together. Um, and let me go back to New York. And now I started with New York City, Fifth Avenue, um, April 15th, 1900. And every time I show horses, horses are so cute. They're so romantic, right? But in fact, they were not. They were anything but. Um, has anyone heard of the horse manure crisis? Well, that was the climate uh, change of the day. Um, in 1880, New York City had 175,000 horses. 
that was before the peak, um, dumping four million pounds of manure each day on New York City streets. And this helped create a massive, massive crisis in city planning. Not just New York City, by the way, every uh, large, wealthy Western city. Um, the environment, imagine this. Uh, when it rained, all this gunk turned into a river of poop, okay? In the summer, it dried up, and when there was wind, where do you think it blew it? That's what people would breathe. Hell, three billion flies per day would hatch in this thing, causing all kinds of deadly infectious diseases, typhoid, infant diarrhea, deaths, congestion. Traffic was so bad in New York and so dangerous on a per capita basis, more people died because of traffic accidents then than do now in New York on a per capita basis. It was dangerous. And death, of course, they had to cart away 15,000 dead horses per year. This was a massive crisis. Um, and there was no way that they could solve this within the existing infrastructure, the existing organizations, the existing system. So the way things were going, I mean, look at what these folks said uh, in London and New York. They were expecting poop to go up to the third floor of every single street in London and New York. I mean, it was ugly. It was really ugly. Um, so um, city planners called the first worldwide urban planning conference. The issue of the day was the horse manure crisis. I mean, it was really, really big. Um, uh, so delegates flew from London, Sydney, and so on to New York. And was that? A flu, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, took a three-month ship. Uh, <laughs> thank you for that. Yeah, I didn't think of that disruption. Um, so after three days, the 10-day conference was broken up, and they were sent home because there were no new ideas. And in fact, if you think about what we're facing today, there are no new ideas. We can't solve the gasoline car crisis within the existing system. Cities have tried congestion pricing and cities have tried preventing parking and cities have, it, it, it's, it is not gonna work within the existing system. And that's what they faced those days. Now, what did solve this was not clean poop, was not manure capture and storage. <laughs> I mean, think about what the energy industry is selling you today as solutions to the energy crisis. Um, it was not fracking manure <laughs> or biofuel poop. None of that stuff. I'm sure they tried it. And I'm sure some people denied that there was a horse manure crisis. <laughs> what horse manure crisis? What are you smoking, poop? <laughs> and by the way, it wasn't solved by a government, you know, target of 30% less poop in 20 years. No, that didn't solve it either. What did solve it was two technology disruptions. One, the automobile. The automobile was an environmental technology at the time, but that's not why it won. It won because it was a disruptive technology. And two, the electric streetcar. That combination of public and private transportation, two different disruptive technologies um, solved the horse manure crisis. And it took less than 15 years. We went from all horse to all car and electric um, streetcar. So, you know, the technologies, the organizations, the culture of the industrial revolution, which is what we've had to endure for 100 years plus, um, are, you know, already run out of steam. Um, they will be replaced by the technologies and the organizations and the innovation and the people that are going to create 
these technologies, the electric vehicles, the self-driving car, big data, mobile internet, and so on, we're going to see more changes over the next 10 to 15 years than we have seen in a hundred years. Um, it's transportation is going to radically change. Um, you know, 80% less parking, highways, 80% fewer cars. Um, and in doing this, basically it's going to open up so much more room for us to have parks, not parking, to have green, to have more density, to have more businesses. And all of this is going to make our cities more livable, cleaner, healthier, and wealthier. Um, and the cities that lead this disruption, the clean disruption, are going to lead the 21st century. And this is not in the future, this is now. It's already happening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. We've got um, plenty of time for questions, so I think we might grab a microphone up the front and let Tony sit down. Um, and we've got some roving mics, so just grab a mic up the front here. So, oh, actually, Tony's got one, so I'll, I'll just... I got it. I mean, right, I, we're, you know, we're fine. I'll no, that's here. for folks who want to... Yeah, I have a mic. Wanna, I'll sit there. Okay, so we've got a question just in there to start with. Where's the mics? <coughs> in there. Actually, I'm just wondering about uh, the fact that we seem to have a three billion dollar train, new train loop being planned for Auckland, and uh, I'm wondering, is there any point? <laughs> Tony, you want to talk about trains? Um, Look, we need both public and private transportation. I mean, I don't know the details of this train. Um, I'll, I would have to take a look at it. Um, but we're going, like in the, in the horse manure disruption, um, the, there was a private and there was a public transportation uh, disruption. And so in my view, uh, self-driving cars are going to get us basically through the core of the city, even the, the suburbs. We're still going to need, you know, transportation from inner city transportation. We're still going to need public transport for social reasons, equity reasons, and so on. Now, I don't know the details of this of this um, uh, project, but um, the, the the what I'm saying is we need we're going to use both, right? I use both today, um, and I don't think that's going to uh, Palo Alto, Stanford is 40 miles from. San Francisco, so I use, you know, basically uh, whatever it is, buses and this and that to take me to the Caltrain station, and that takes me to Stanford. So I don't know if I answered your, your question. Yeah. Thanks, Tony. Yeah, Tony, Tony uh, I yes. agree with you 100%. I've just got one question. Is yes. How do I get my boat down to the water? Are you asking me or inviting yeah, me? Yeah, no, I'm asking you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, self-driving cars are going to do everything that, that gasoline cars do, only better and cheaper and faster. Other um, questions? Question at the, at the back there. Yes, yep, we can hear you. Um, Tony, you talk about um, the combinatorial explosion of d data. Yes. What about the um, combinatorial explosion of data storage and um, revolutionising the sustainability of that going forward because we're going to have, you know, in, in polite terms, fuckloads of data. <laughs> and what do we do with it and how do we store it yeah. in a sustainable way too if we're going to make these cities clean long term? Yeah. Um, huh? <laughs> yeah. We're going to have to power all that with... with so the, 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 the part that I didn't talk about today um, is the energy generation. Uh, portion. Um, and basically in energy generation, the, the, the whole dirty energy industry is going to be disrupted, period. I mean, um, I could spend another hour, I won't, talking about that disruption, but, you know, technologies like solar uh, are improving also exponentially, and solar is going to eat everything, uh, period. Um, 
So that's going to happen too. Uh, lithium ion is improving, solar is improving, uh, wind is improving, and so that's going to disrupt everything. Yeah. All right, next question just down here. Please. <coughs> Hello, oh, my name is Oli Mikosha. I'm looking forward to our discussion, Tony. Uh, but on 8th of April, in Mountain View, Google, for the first time, publicly endorsed personal rapid transit. And that's additional technology, which actually was not even discussed by Oakland, by mayor, by the council, which for the price for that tunnel, which will solve nothing, there are two billion trips in cars in Auckland and 10 million <coughs> will be by train. So it's zero, zero, one percent. Uh, what I'm asking is that this technology which combines Google cars, self-driving last mile, 400 kilometers of Auckland could be covered by the price of that one tunnel and many cities as well. Now, isn't that possibly a technology which could be complementary, a third one to the ones that you've mentioned, which actually uh, is much more efficient even than Google uh, cars because they will not quite offload the traffic jams. As you know, traffic jams happen in peak times and Mountain View is today 23 times more percent more congested than last year. So uh, Google cars will be standing in the traffic jams even though they will be tightly packed. Right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, I disagree with what you're saying. Um, I think uh, self-driving cars are far, 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 far how many farts did I say? Um, more efficient and better drivers than any one of us. Um, and basically there's gonna be so much room. Uh, they, can, they can drive in packs within you know, inches of one another. Um, you know, will we need uh, another disruptive technology? Maybe, uh, you, know, you know, show me the data and I'll change my mind, but I just haven't seen it, yeah. Okay. Simon. Thanks, Brett. Tony, it's easy to see disruptive change in retrospect, um, but I wonder um, how, it, how hard it, or how do we see it coming and how do you plan for it? There must have been examples of false starts of what looked like disruptive change that didn't go anywhere. And um, you know, that seems to me the most important thing now is to be able to say, this is a real one and this is what we need to plan for. How yeah. do you do that? No, that's a very good question. Um, you know, we, in, in solar, we had, a, we had a, an early start in the 80s and then it fizzled. Uh, EVs also had a, a false start in the 90s. Um, but, but what I'm looking at is that we have already reached critical mass. Uh, and basically, the, the mass that, that, that of the, the adoption curve at this point in terms of number of people, technology, cost curve, is just, you know, uh, too compelling to not happen. At this point, uh, when you look at the cost curve, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And by the way, it's going to happen whether we want it or not, because technologies, as you may know, have their own um, uh, momentum. Um, and so at this point, uh, the way I see it, we have only two choices. We, meaning as city planners, as, as a country, as, um, as a region, we only have two choices. This is going to happen because the technology is taking us there. Um, the question is, do you want to lead or do you want to follow? And the cities and the regions and the countries that lead will become wealthier. I mean, this is going to need a whole lot of technologies uh, and we're still gonna need entrepreneurs. We're still gonna need new technologies to put it all together. Uh, the Googles and the Facebooks and the Nokias of the clean disruption are only now being built. Um, so by leading, we can make mistakes, but we can also build the billion dollar companies that are going to make this happen. But, you know, essentially, we only have the choice of leading or following. Okay, I've got a question here and then one over there and then we'll keep, we'll keep going. We've got plenty of time. Hi, Tony. It's Oscar here. Um, I just, you've made a compelling case for how this is going to change, and you've said that countries or cities should become leaders, but how with, with this technology is coming, with Uber and Google driverless cars are coming, what changes do we need to make in the planning? And, and who's we? The city? The or city, um, residents of the city, entrepreneurs, how yeah. do we take the advantage of it, and how do we 
become worldwide leader? Look, this is, a, again, it's a technology disruption. As an entrepreneur, you find an opportunity, you, you jump on it, right? Um, as a city, as a region, uh, if assuming that, that Auckland wants to lead, uh, at this point, it's a matter of political will. Um, if you know that this is happening uh, and you do want to lead, then it's a matter of political will to make all of the pieces happen to enable the regulatory environment, the financial environment, and so on to make this thing happen. So the government is not going to make it happen. It could help not make it happen, right, uh, by the wrong regulations and by putting money in the wrong projects and by backing old industries and protecting, you know, oil and gas and all those things, right? Um, but in th at the end of the day, it's entrepreneurs mm -hmm. who make this happen. It's not governments. Uh, so from the government, we need, you know, the right regulations and the right environment to do that. We need investments in education and R&D and, and so on. But it's you, it's entrepreneurs who are going to make it happen. Question at the back. Yeah. Hello, Tony. My name is Ray Talbot. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, there was a program on Radio New Zealand about a, a solar highway. Yes. In the in in the US, they did they actually tested it. They got <coughs> the skid resistance to work. Mm -hmm. They could get the road markings to work. Right. I was wondering what your take on that particular product was. Um, I I've I've seen the video. They have not tested it. Um, there's no cost data. There's no. Uh, I mean, this is a video that went viral. I'd love to meet their PR agency, uh, <laughs> but it has not been tested. We know nothing about it except that there's a video and, and, and it went viral. Um, having said that, um, without having seen the data, um, uh, highways are not a very good place to put um, solar. Uh, you know, there's plenty of rooftop, there's plenty of parking lots, there's plenty of uh, land, uh, landfills, and so on to put up solar. Um, you know, one of the reasons is, of course, 80% of these roads are going to be obsolete within a few years, so why put up solar? But the main reason is highways are very expensive on a per mile basis, uh, and we don't have data about this, this solar highway. Okay. Ms. Chair, and then if you can pass the microphone forward to the per person in front of you when you've finished, thanks. Um, one of the most exciting things <coughs> I was thinking about is this could lead to a depersonalization of my car because my car, his car, their car means we have <coughs> lots and lots of cars and if these electric cars can be dropped off and someone else can pick it up and drop another one off, yeah. you have so far fewer in cities like Shanghai or Sao Paulo that are actually unlivable because of traffic right now. Yeah, no, I agree, I agree. We're not gonna need to own cars, we're not. I mean, like, you know, Airbnb, what they have done to, to uh, homes, uh, which is now we share our homes with total strangers. Who knew that 10 years mm -hmm. ago, right? You know, th this is a different generation of sharing. We're all about sharing, we're all about social now, we're all on Facebook and LinkedIn. Um, so it's gonna be about sharing cars and, and that's gonna be one more thing that we're not gonna have to own, yeah. And actually just to e emphasize that, that the estimates for the, the uh, recent FIFA World Cup were that 20% of the people that visited Brazil stayed um, in an Airbnb home. So, you know, straight away, uh, yeah. you know, when you're doing, when you're in planning for long-term accommodation in the city, um, you've got a you've got a different different disruptive view. Absolutely, absolutely. That. I have a little presentation before we go there um, on um, basically what we're gonna uh, do with that unused garage in our homes, um, whether it's Airbnb or you know a little a nursery or whatever. We're not gonna need that parking space. Yeah. More questions? Oh yeah. Tony, uh, fantastic presentation, thank you very much. Um, there were two technologies you talked about, electric vehicles and self-drive cars. Yes, yes. Clearly, clearly electric vehicles is a stepping stone to self-drive cars. Yes. What would you suggest to Auckland as a city to, uh, what three suggestions you would you have for ad adopting electric vehicles in Auckland city? Yeah. Um, 
you know, it, again, it's very simple. All of this is going to happen, okay? So your only choice is here, do you want to lead? And then everything else is easy. Because if you do want to lead, then, you know, you look at the regulations. You look at the, you know, parking spaces that are being subsidized today. You look at, uh, you know, all the, the, the projects, the 40-year projects for highways and for uh, all of transportation and, and so on. And you're going to look at it in this light. Does this fit into this uh, new mode of transportation? And in fact, I think that should be the case anyway, any project should be looked at in these terms. Um, but basically the one decision, rather than you know, tactical things, is strategic, is the vision. Do you want to lead, right? Do you want to, Helsinki has said, yes, we want to lead, right? So that's, that's a decision, do you want to lead? And then everything else follows. All right, who else we got? Okay, thank you. Just here. Tony, hi, Tony yes. before. Yeah. Um, taxation. Yes. I mean, one of the big things, particularly here in New Zealand, I don't think we're particularly any different to anywhere mm. else, is there's quite high tax on fuel and other things associated with transport, and that funds a significant number of government initiatives. Now, at the moment, electricity is essentially not taxed for the consumer. There's a cost of delivery and everything. But as electric vehicles and other electric things move forward and people move away from gasoline vehicles, mm -hmm. the cost is going to have to rise because the government's going to have to change their taxation practices. Cost for what? Cost for what? For, for transporting from one place to another. The cost of electricity for charging vehicles and things has got to go up to fill the void that will be created by the loss of taxation on internal combustion engines and current cars on, on the roads. The cost of internal combustion engines today is higher than what they bring you. The cost in healthcare, the cost in uh, free parking, the cost in highways is way higher than what you're paying in taxes. Um, so, and in, in, in that's one. Two, the cost of forms of energy, you know, like solar, are going down, not up. Um, and so energy is actually going to be cheaper. It's going to be distributed. It's going to be cheaper than it is today. Um, so, so I just said that those taxes are going to be, you know, basically uh, unnecessary in terms of, um, uh, so energy is going to be lower, not higher, uh, because that, that technology is going down. The cost is going down, not up. Uh, do you need to replace those taxes with something else? Probably. Uh, but also you're not going to have all the costs related to, you know, the people, 500 people who die every year because of car accidents or 500 people who die because of oil pollution or coal or whatever, right? So you have to weigh both the costs and, uh, and the revenues before you can say this is going to raise our, our prices. All right, I've got a question at the back, then one here, then one here. Thank you. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, so I just had a question um, about the idea of a, a clean car, because on the surface, of course, electric cars appear very clean because, mm. of course, no carbon emissions. But what about the production, especially of the battery? Because the battery involves, you know, the chemicals and carbon dioxide pollution is a very important form of pollution. But yeah. what about the chemical pollution caused by the, produ the production mm. and disposal of these batteries? And especially the fact that they will be produced in countries like New Zealand and other first world countries have very high environmental standards, but these batteries will inevitably be produced in countries of very low environmental standards and uh, right. surely... Like yeah. the United States, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so the largest factory in the world... Did I mention that the largest factory of batteries in the world is going to be in the US? Now, did I also mention that it's going to be 100% powered by solar and wind? Okay and that they're going to use their own batteries to store that energy to power its own factory. Um, so, you know, I, 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 yes, look, everybody poops, right? Um, you know, every time you get in your car, you're going to, um, there's no option that is 100% clean, just none, right? Uh, I think that us leaders and policymakers and, 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 conscientious uh, folks 
we need to minimize, uh, you know, if we want to keep our standards of living, any form of pollution and so on and so forth, right? Uh, and I think that this industry, uh, EV and solar and so on, um, basically is as conscientious as you will find anywhere. Um, and yes, you know, EV batteries are going to pollute. Anything is going to pollute. Uh, it's just a matter of degrees. Um, just to give you an indication, seven million people die every year of indoor and outdoor air pollution caused mostly by uh, pollution from fossil fuels. Seven million people a year. So, you know, will lithium ion batteries pollute? Yeah, we're gonna save seven million people every year, okay? In 10 years, that's 70 million people. That's more people than died in any war ever in the history of humankind except World War II. Does that make sense? That's an appalling number. So I get what you're saying, but what we have now is a crisis of unheard of proportions because of the energy, dirty energy sources that we're using today. Okay, and Chris. I'm happy that New Zealand is 80% clean yeah. as far as power, right? Question there, and we'll just move that microphone to the gentleman just sitting in the middle there. Thank you. I'm just thinking about the implications for city planning, which is the question that's sort of floating <coughs> around here. Um, and a lot of city planning isn't really very future oriented. In fact, most of it isn't. Most of it is adapting to what's already happened. And I think that with this disruption that you're projecting, and I don't take an issue with anything you're saying at all, um, a lot of the adaptation is going to take a really long time to happen. We're still adapting to the automobile. It's been around for 100 years. We're still building highways. We're still making them safer. We're still you know, getting better fuel efficiency from them. And when it comes to leadership, I think that's going to be really hard for government to do because governments, <coughs> like local governments, are, you know, tend to be real risk averse. And they don't want to be the first city in the world to tear up their motorway system. That is a really risky yeah. kind of action. Is so there a question? It's going to... Yes, there is a question. It's just going to take a long time for this very rapid disruption to finish its disruption. Then what comes after that? Right. So how do you manage these various phases of this disruption? Okay. So I disagree with you that it's going to take a long time. I think I mentioned that by 2030 it's going to be all over. Um, and, you know, it's not true that all governments, uh, you know, are risk averse. Germany has set really high goals for clean energy. Uh, Helsinki said that they want to do this by 2025. So, you know, when there is political will, uh, you know, they can make it happen. So if you're talking about every government, then I agree, but not, you know, but, but there might be exceptions, and we do know exceptions, like Germany and like Finland and so on. Okay, question here. Yes, yes. Well, why doesn't uh, New York City install a, a light rail, a streetcar system between those three places so that instead of people getting into onto thousands of electric taxis mm -hmm. to travel between those two locations, that they just hop onto a, a streetcar? Right, right. Wouldn't, wouldn't I have that suggested be more it. disruptive? I've suggested it, you know. I don't know why they do things the way they do, but I have suggested it. A a and is it, isn't a, an a, uh, electric uh, driverless vehicle just another name for an electric train or a, a light rail system? Um, you mean the one that I that I showed? Yeah, you, you've got you've got people sitting in little cars that are yeah. electric powered yeah. when they could be sitting in an electric train. Yeah. Look, I mean, what I what I said was. Once you know this, once you have the big data and you understand the issue, then you start small. You start with a $200,000 project, see if it works. If a lot of people use it, then you build on that. And whether that means an electric streetcar project or it means 100 of these things, then it's a decision that you need to make based on the data and based on the trial that you make with this kind of technology. Does that make sense? That's what I'm suggesting. Thank you. Yeah. 
Okay, a question over there, and then this lady just here, and then the man in the orange, and then we're done. Yep, so yeah, thank you. Please. My question is, is there a lithium fly in the ointment? Is there enough lithium on the planet yes. to do all this, or there's, is there alternative uh, battery technologies in the wings? Yes, so the answer to both is yes. Um, lithium is one of the most abundant elements on Earth. Um, there is plenty of lithium if that's the way the world is going to go for 15 or 20 years. Um, having said that, um, there are really interesting and super disruptive uh, technologies that are being developed today in the lab um, using, for instance, graphene. Um, and if you haven't heard of graphene, um, graphene is, um, has, I think, a thousand times the conductivity of copper. Um, it has an unbelievable energy density and so on and so forth. So we're not there just yet. I mean, I, I'm, I, I base all my predictions on existing technologies and existing cost curves, right? Because, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't wanna make predictions based on miracles. I just wanna follow the existing curve. Having said that, we are gonna get breakthroughs and I think that in 15 years, the batteries are going to be graphene, carbon nanotubes, or some sort of nanotechnology-based uh, batteries that are 10x, 50x, uh, more energy dense, smaller, cheaper, and so on and so forth. Um, I know one at least entrepreneur who developed a technology based on carbon nanotubes that is anywhere from 10 times to 100 times the uh, energy th that has up to 100 times the energy density and the power density of lithium ion. Imagine that. Um, so, you know, conceivably you could power uh, 400 miles, 500 miles with a battery yay big, maybe smaller, right? So, but that's just my opinion. We need breakthroughs to happen. Um, if we keep going down the cost curve with lithium ion, that in and of itself will take us to basically what I'm projecting. All right, please. This is actually more of a comment really in relation to um, a question about taxation. Yes. The Auckland Council at the moment has a draft policy out on car parking or parking. And at one of the workshops it was explained that the, how much it costs to run a car park, and it is far cheaper to run even petrol-based um, shuttle buses than car parks and covering everything with concrete. So it must be cheaper again to have it if they were electric powered. Thank you for that. And just the man behind you in the Startup Weekend T-shirt, nice to see that. Uh, hi, Tony, thank you. I just spoke a lot about city planners, and I wanted to talk about, uh, at the beginning you said there was the public and the private combination. Uh, with the new disruption, you have then two clouds. Potentially, you have the Google private cloud that is gathering data that you know they will try to sell you something and they will know everywhere of where you go. So, how do you see the not so much the plan? I don't know of any planner that would uh, salivate at a three trillion sensor data point Excel spreadsheet. But how how are you going uh, to yeah. create that <coughs> wisdom within city the city planning uh, committees and cities? to manage the, the, the data in the cloud. Yeah. So it's more of a wisdom question that I don't think we have necessarily talked about because that's what's really going to be. You're gonna have the private cloud, but also the city is going to hire a private company for a public good and who is going to not dip into the honey jar of the, the data that will be mm -hmm. generated every mm -hmm. second. Yeah. Um, so I, I thanks for that question. I think it's very good. I think that we should be concerned about privacy uh, we should be concerned about who owns the data. Um, but we should be concerned about privacy today. It's not going to be different. I mean, the only difference is going to be we're going to have 10 or 100 times the data and the granularity that we have today. Uh, but we should be concerned about privacy today. I mean, we should be concerned about who you put, what you put out there on Facebook and, and so on and so forth, right? So uh, I think that, that policymakers should have privacy, individual, citizen, privacy in mind when this is happening. Yes, I agree with you. Yeah. 
Yes. All right. I, th I think we're going to have to wrap the, the questions okay. there. I know that um, that there'll be a lo lot of other people that want to uh, talk to Tony, and he'll be here afterwards. So please, um, please take that opportunity. Can I now ask Councillor Wayne Walker to um, to make some cl some closing remarks? Thanks, Brad. It's all good. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank you for being here, and thank all of you for being here. This has been a fantastic evening. I'd like to kick off. Ah just by disruptive technology, by thanking a number of people again. Thank you, Brett, MC. Brett's involved with AT, which is all around Auckland's economic development. It's a CCO, it's nimble, it's fast, it's capable of actually bringing a number of these things together. I'd like to acknowledge Mighty River Power that helped to make this possible, Cloud M, who were instrumental in bringing Tony out, few others, Gelcon, Resine, ANDC, that's architects and designers of New Zealand, and there are a bundle of others that have been up on the screen. I'd also like to acknowledge Mike Chun and the young lady who was positively magnificent, and that was Grace Rebner. So can we put our hands together disruptively for all of them? I'd also like to acknowledge Auckland Conversations. That's the facility that puts this together, puts other events together. It runs on the smell of an oily rag. It is disruptive. And there's a wonderful woman called Susan Quinn. Are you in the audience, Susan? You've got to be here somewhere. You want to stand up? OK. So Susan does a positively magnificent job pulling people in, promoting it. We need to promote it more. We need to make these events bigger because Tony's right. This is inevitable. It's going to happen, and either we kind of pretend it's not or we go along for the ride. And I would suggest all of us need to be along for the ride and we need to take this on and be disruptive ourselves. And I guess that's the message I want to put forward. Auckland's in a crucial phase right now. You've seen the publicity in the papers about the budget. And we're talking about billions of dollars worth of expenditure. From my perspective, we need to have scenarios. We need to be demanding options. You need to be demanding options because this is all a public engagement process and part of it I would suggest needs to be around political disruption the sort of stuff that's that Tony's talking about we got national elections this year and dare I say it this kind of stuff is really important to what happens in New Zealand right now we're talking about oil exploration we're talking about more coal we're talking about massive expenditure billions upon billions in roads I don't agree with that myself. I think that there are other choices that need to be put on the table. The same applies with Auckland. One of the things that Tony mentioned in an earlier session that I heard today was about cities. And cities are where it's at. Cities can lead, and it's cities that are making the change around disruptive technology, around these changes, and helping to put things together. I would suggest that you will need to be part of that. If I can give a personal plug to something that is Auckland's Low Carbon Action Plan. There's a base one blueprint that's out there. It's on the council website. Hopefully you can tap into it. But the whole idea is to externalise this process and have it driven by business, community, social, environmental. There are lots of business opportunities here and there are lots of opportunities for government. So it's early days yet, but I'd really suggest you get in behind that. If I can also just give a bit of a plug, because Tony's a very modest guy. This is a great book, Clean Disruption. You can get it in hard copy form. You can also get it on Amazon. That's right, isn't it, Tony? Okay. And the really good thing about this book, like Tony, is it uses humour. You've got examples. You've got case studies. 
And there's a bundle of things that Tony hasn't covered off. And he could have told you about the disruption to coal and nuclear and biofuels and finance and water. So there's a whole lot of other stuff that goes to this that's really important that I think we need to get our heads around. So with that, if we can just put our, our hands together again for Tony, who's going to be around again. Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you.